name is Marty Coleman. I am the owner of Make Studio, which is a photography and design studio. Um, and I'm also the napkin dad. Uh, I draw on napkins. You'll see some of these. Uh, the last two times I was here, I talked about the napkin dad persona. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about my um, other life, and that is as a photographer. I like to think of myself as the world's best bad photographer. So you guys are not having to worry about if you're a good photographer or not, because I'm one of the baddest. But I create really good images. And the reason I do is because I think about what's compelling. What do people want? What draws their attention? Okay, So that's what we're going to talk about. I got you here a little bit under um, false pretenses, because it says, in the age of social media, and it doesn't really matter. You could say, in the age of Abraham Lincoln. You could say, in the age of Theodore Roosevelt, or World War II, or any time since photography's been invented. Actually, we could go back even farther, because compelling images before photography were still important. Um, the key is the compelling. The key is the image, not the distribution of the image. That matters, and we'll talk about that, but it doesn't matter as much as you might think. As a matter of fact, people tend to think that it's not as important because of social media, and it actually is more important because of social media. Okay? So, here's a, a secret. You want an audience. Don't pretend you don't. That's why you're here. So if you want an audience, you are in social media, it may be your company, it may be you as an individual, it may be you as an entrepreneur, uh, but some way you want to get attention. And having a compelling image is one of the best ways to have that attention. So let's not pretend we don't want it. We want it, let's figure out how to get it the best way possible. So, some of the pros of having a compelling image, an image at all, is it transcends language, obviously. Uh, you don't need an interpreter for the photograph. It's faster than reading, uh, so it lessens the need for the descriptive text if it's a good photograph. Stimulating visually, which means it's attention getting and it's emotional. For example, if I tweet that I'm here with Cheryl at SM Tulsa, People read and go, oh, that's interesting. If I show a photograph of me and Cheryl smiling, having a good time, people say, oh, I wish I was at SM Tulsa. That's a big difference. Connecting personally, someone or someplace they know means more to them than the words, like I just said. Sharing easily, obviously, there's tons of outlets for the, for the visual image. People go there all the time to see those visual images. As a matter of fact, Facebook just did a big review. Why? Because they're going to put more preeminence on the visual image. So, but there are some cons to it. Privacy is dead, and social media holds the smoking gun. Okay? It's eternal. It goes online, stays online. So don't let your boyfriend do this. Okay? And if you're going to do this, make sure that it's uh, classy. Make sure that it has a reason. It's nothing wrong. I'm like, some of my best friends are nude sometimes. But make sure you know why you're doing it and make sure it's a good reason, okay? Uh, it goes online and it stays online. It's manipulatable. Images can be changed. Sometimes I take photographs of strangers and I'll say, what are you gonna do with that? He said, I'm gonna chop up your head and put it on one star. And they're like, oh. Actually, I could do that, right? People can do that. So think about that. Uh, stealable. Images can be taken and you'll never even know it. In, um, uh, I've been on Flickr for a long time, and one of my uh, friends on Flickr is from Iceland. Did fantastic photographs, got well known all around the world for it. And a year after she took the photograph, she realized that there was a calendar being sold in England of her work that they never asked her for, never, no, they just decided to, they thought they were cool and started selling calendars of her work. And it was really hard for her to figure out how to get them to stop. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if she ever got them to stop. Um, 
it also can be misinterpreted, obviously. So, uh, I mean, this can't be misinterpreted. That's why uh, Representative Wiener is no longer Representative Wiener, uh, because he showed his wiener. Uh, and that wasn't misinterpreted. That was just something stupid. But it can be misinterpreted if you do something that other people can say, oh, it looks like she or he is doing this. Watch out for that. And then obviously unwanted attention, your boss, your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, all of those people can see something that could be innocent to you. You know, I mean, you hear about that all the time with celebrities who they have some picture of them in a bar talking to a woman and then it's all in the tabloids that the wife is upset because there's this picture of him in the bar and it turns out he was planning a surprise party, blah, blah, blah. Can be misinterpreted, so watch out for it. Okay, so let's talk about why, more detail, why you want a compelling image. So a whole bunch of different reasons beyond this, but in sales, you need a great image. You have to have a great image of your product. If you don't have a compelling image, nobody wants to look at it. Nobody's going to look at it. They're going to swipe right on by. Information, that's photo, that's text, infographics, sequence of images. You want to get a setup shot. You want to get close-up detail so that that information is imparted logically to people and they can get through it clearly and concisely. Promoting and advertising, the location, the environment, the clarity of purpose. That's one of the main things. Why are you taking this picture? You're advertising something. You're promoting something. Don't get lost in, ooh, cool, isn't that color nice? And so you take a whole bunch of pictures of that color, and it doesn't say anything about the event you're promoting. Focus on what that is. Biography, make the portrait match the person's real image. Who are you projecting? We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Who are you projecting when you take a photograph of either yourself or someone else? What is another person going to interpret that photograph to be about? Okay. History, obviously, you can use special effects, you can use costumes, locations, um, but consistency of history. And what, what, I, what I mean by history is um, if you want to do a role playing thing where you're historical, or you want to show something about the, the Maya Hotel in the past, or you're doing a photo shoot about the Roaring Twenties or something like that, all these things are important the costumes and the locations and the special effects, but the consistency is key too, because people online can have a lot of education about that, and they'll see right away, oh yeah, that dress is from the 30s, that, you, you said this is the 20s, and then also they don't think you're valid anymore. Okay, and then obviously, if you're gonna do action, you wanna have a fast camera and a fast lens, but that's not always the case. It is possible to take some really cool action photographs uh, with even a simple camera phone and a simple uh, iPad or something like that, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the quintessential thing that we all have. What do we all have? We all have a head, okay? And we want to have a good photograph of that head. If you don't, then you're confused. Who is this woman and what is she trying to represent about herself? Anybody? She's gorgeous. Okay, she's gorgeous. Pretty. Is she a glamorous? Is she a college student? Is she an intern? Is she a young mother? I mean, is she a party girl? I mean, you know, look at it. It's kind of indefinite. Who is she now? What is she promoting now? What's her identity now? Maybe she is promoting uh, hair products. Maybe. Maybe she has a beauty blog. Would you know she had a beauty blog by looking at that? She's beautiful, but you wouldn't necessarily know she has a beauty blog. Here, maybe you know she has a beauty blog. Okay, anybody know who she really is? Okay, if you go online and you type in before and after porn stars, guess what you will have? You'll have a series of about 40 photographs that a makeup artist took over a period of five years of porn stars before and after. And it's incredible the difference. Obviously, that's not what I'm putting her up here for, but it just goes to show, 
it just goes to show how different a good photograph can be. Some of the things that are going on here, by the way, this is in the shadows. The fact that she has no makeup on is one thing. That's not a big deal. But it's in the shadows, and you don't really know anything about the environment. Here, it's front lighting. And we'll talk about front lighting again. Okay. So, who is this woman? What is she about? Why should you trust her with something? Do you know anything about her by this photograph? She could be at a party. Who's this guy with his hand around her? What is she doing? You don't really know, do you? It's kind of, I don't know. Does this, do you want this to be her profile picture? Especially if she's in any kind of business? No. How about this photograph? This photograph is what? It's confident. It's a little bit sexy. It's uh, classy. It's designed. It's got some style to it. It's got some professional quality to it. So if you saw this photograph and it turned out that she was in PR and marketing, would you be surprised? No, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I would say that looks like someone who could be in PR and marketing, doing some marketing stuff. Not so much that. So the whole point is what the photograph you take or someone else takes of your head matters. Do you trust this guy? <laughs> Did you come here to see this guy? Do you want to hear what he knows about photography? Is this a good portrait for him to have on his photo site? Or is this a good photograph to have on his photo site? Hmm. I mean, it's still the same face. I'm stuck with the face. But this says one thing, and that says another. Okay? So I think you get the point. Okay. So. Let's get real quick into uh, a rose by any other name gets lost. If you have a photograph, you need to label it and title it correctly. You may not think so because you're just going to pop it up on Facebook or Twitter and it's off into the Twitterverse, but that's not true because five years from now, you're going to go want to look at how you used to weigh 200 pounds and now you weigh 150 and you're trying to find that photograph and it's named Two five three eight two three four zero blah blah blah, and you can't find it. So don't do this. Don't do multiple extensions. Don't do some whatever comes out of the camera stuff. That's okay for the first posting, but later when you have time, go back and type it. Don't look dot com dot com. Photographs don't aren't dot com. Websites are dot com. Don't put dot com behind an image. So silly, funny, ha ha. That's not really going to help you later on. And either is, I look like, yeah. that's like, I mean, I could have put that one on the photograph I had first of myself, but you got to watch out for that. So here's what you should use. Name, style, what do I mean by style? Black and white maybe, sepia maybe, something like that. Uh, the date, the location, and the size. It seems real simple, but so here's a photograph I took of a friend of mine, uh, Michelle Lynn. How am I going to go find this photograph in three years when she says, my mom just saw that photograph on Facebook and she really likes it. Do you, can you get me a print of it? I'm going to find it because I'm going to call it M. Lynn 629-12 Philbrook Small. I have the name of the person, I have the date of the person, I have where I took it, and I have the dimension of it because I might have a large one, a small one, I might have a thumbnail one, things like that. Okay? That's important. Okay, that's just some of the underpinnings of this. Folders and directories, you want to make sure those are, log those are logical too because if that picture so well labeled of Michelle is in a folder that says uh, uh, blondes in the summer, I'm not going to necessarily be able to find that. But if it says 2012 field book, or it says 2012 portraits, or you know, client, or something like that, I'm going to be able to find it. So that matters. OK, so we are going to get almost immediately to exercises that we're going to do when I was upstairs, when I supposedly was going to be doing this up in the park. <coughs> 
Um, I had us stopping each time and we're going to do certain things. But because we're in this room, we're, I'm going to go through all this. And then we're going to get up. We're going to go out into the lobby, out into that room over there, into this room, and we're going to implement some of these things. Okay? So the first one is the portrait, the front light portrait. There's all sorts of different lighting you can do on people, but I want you to focus on the idea of the front light portrait because that's where you really are going to get the, the easiest photograph to get of someone in the best light is the front light portrait. It is one thing to photograph people, it is another to make others care about them by revealing the core of their humanness. That's not always necessarily a front portrait, but a front portrait is a way to get them right in front of the person. Okay. This woman was at the first social media Tulsa and was in my uh, was in my session. Her name's Erin Carlisle, <coughs> and we became friends. And I did a photo shoot of her. And this is front light outside her sliding glass door at her apartment. That's all it was. She was just leaning forward into it. No lights, no fancy. I mean, I have a camera. It's really not all that fancy the camera. Um, and it's just as simple as that. I converted it to sepia, which you can do on any cell phone practically. And there you go. <coughs> this is under a tent at the Renaissance Fair. I captured it right at that moment where this guy, had, he didn't even know this woman. They were both working there. He just came up and kissed her, and she was nice enough to not slap him across the face. And I captured that. But there it was an intended area with nice flat front lighting, reflected lighting. And that's often when you're talking about front lighting, you're talking about reflected lighting. You're talking about lighting that's coming from an ambient source in front of you towards the person. Okay? You're, the light's behind you, you're taking the picture this way towards the person in the light. Okay, sunlight, this is still kind of front lighting, a little bit directional, but you get the idea that it's still front lighting. Um, you know, when you're dealing with sunlight, one of the best things to think about is the time of day. There's what's called the golden hour, and actually there are two golden hours. There's the golden hour after sunrise and before sunset, and you can great, get great photographs. Okay, especially if you have the Pacific Ocean behind you. Okay. But maybe you don't just want the photograph of the person. Maybe what you really want is them in their environment. So you just saw the photograph of her, and that told one story about her. But when you get environmental with your portraits, then you start to tell a different story. If you ever look at um, fashion magazines, you notice oftentimes they show models not just by themselves, but in situations like this, where they're standing right there next to some local guy fishing. And they do that because it's more interesting. It says a place, it says a world, instead of just the person. Okay? So think about environmental portraits. How do you create an image of the person that you're trying to take a picture of that includes their environment, that includes saying something about the world they're in? Okay? This is my daughter, Chelsea. She's a singer-songwriter in uh, Berkeley, and she was uh, performing at this place called the Foundry, and you know, it was a typical Berkeley kind of totally dilapidated place. And I took her out uh, back towards uh, some really cool lighting and, and took this photograph of her. But it sets up a dynamic. It starts to set up a storytelling device that helps you understand the person. You can kind of see this almost possibly being an album cover, for example, that might be titled, you know, Sagebrush or whatever. You know what I mean? It starts to move in that direction for you. So the environmental portrait expands on just a regular portrait. This is another one of my daughters. We were down at the Pumpkin Festival at the Dallas Arboretum. And uh, guess what she loves? Pumpkins. 
So I took a whole bunch of photographs of her for uh, my wife, her mother, uh, to surprise her for Christmas. And we were walking by this row of pumpkins, and she had this orange shirt on. I was like, "Come on, you got it. You got to stand there for. You got to stand there. This is like a perfect photograph." So she did, and that says something beyond just a photograph of her. Okay, so a partial portrait. Photography lesson number one, it's actually number 475, but that's okay. Don't shoot what it looks like, shoot what it feels like. I'm a runner, and you sometimes see this, and sometimes you see people that are completely wiped out at the end of a marathon or a half marathon or something like that. And photographing them with the metal smiling is one thing, but if you're trying to get across the idea of the pain of that, of the suffering of that, of the resilience of the person, start to look elsewhere. Start to look beyond just the face of the person, okay? We're talking about a partial portrait that may not even include the face. So this is a portrait of a friend of mine from high school. Uh, and, you know, straight on, easy going, nothing to it. But this is also a portrait of her. No face, but it has power and it has um, meaning and it says something kind of emotional about her holding herself in. No face in it, but it's still a portrait of her. Partial portrait doesn't show the whole thing. This was at the Scottish Festival. I got down below the guy and I took the photograph. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. So when you're thinking about making a compelling <coughs> image, don't think about the most obvious thing that everybody's going to pass by just like that. Think about what is what compels you. Think about what the what's attracting you. With I saw this, I really wanted to get the feeling of this structure here and the, you know the whole thing. I didn't want to just get this distance. This was at the same festival. She was hawking cars. And this said a lot more to me than a photograph straight on of the front of her. Because why is she hawking the car instead of frumpy me? Because she's got the curves of the car. That's why. So I found that curve in both of them, and I grabbed it. And it <laughs> says, <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> and yes, right after that, I can't think it slapped me. <laughs> um, but the point is, the point is that you're not always going to find the most telling image by looking at the person's face. Okay. Partial portrait at the Renaissance Fair. You see her face? No, you don't see her face. But what do you see? That, that's a compelling picture. I mean, I see you right there. You're going. You know, a lot of people do that. You look at that and go, oh, that says more than a portrait of her smiling. So think about that as you as you go about. Taking your pictures. Okay. This is actually photography lesson number closer to one. This is the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds is a way for you to create visual dynamic in the image so people have something to go around with their eye. People read images the same way they read text. In the Western world, really, they're going to start reading it left to right. And that's what's happening here. But there's a whole bunch of things that are keeping people interested as they revolve around this image compositionally. And the reason for that is because it's divided up in thirds. <coughs> so you can see we have a policeman, we have a bridge, we have a fountain. We have a structure, we have a bridge, we have a fountain. Each way, there's a division of thirds. So when you're taking a photograph, don't think about plopping somebody or something center. Think about moving them off to the side, because compelling images have something people want to look through. They want to travel throughout the image. And if you smack dab someone right in the middle, 
it better be a dang good picture because otherwise it's going to be static. Okay? This was in um, Yellowstone. Uh, you can see the same thing. Break up, middle, and uh, the close-up of the white area right down there. Same thing with the breakup of the thirds. Um, and I'm not talking about you trying making this exactly at a third. That's not really the point. The point is to think about areas of interest in your photograph and move to the side a little bit. Get something else into the image besides that one thing. Okay? Third, third, third. Another thing to think about, even though I don't mention it here, is repetition. Repetition is a great thing as long as I mean, too much repetition and it's boring, but repetition also helps an eye move across an image or up and down an image. Okay? Okay, so uh, it's important to get hot. And you might be thinking, oh, wait a second. You're looking down. That's right. Because I'm high above it. Now, I'm only five foot nine above it, but I'm looking down, which means I'm high, looking down at something. Okay? What happens is the horizon line moves up. You allow for more detail in the foreground, and you allow for more visual interest moving back into space when you do something like this. Okay? Okay, this is uh, my photo group, which I'll mention at the end, the Tulsa Digital Photography Group. Uh, this was one of our dinners, and I made everybody take a picture of me, taking a picture of them, and where was I when I took this picture? I was on the chair. You want to get a good party shot? You want to get a good shot of your family at a table? Get up on a chair. Take the picture looking down at them. Why? Because you're up high. Okay. A couple different things going on here. Obviously, I found these very interesting as a design. There's repetition, but there's also difference as you go across. Now, if I'm putting together a photo album for my daughter of our trip to Cape Cod, and I have picture after picture of her smiling with person, 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 that's okay. But if I went up to her room and took a picture of all the shoes she had to choose from every single day, and she looks at that five years from now, that's a pretty cool memory for her compared to just smile, 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 smile. This says something that means something to her. So I did it by looking down at something instead of just straight ahead at something. Okay? Okay. This is my, my daughter, you know, so various grains for a while and thought that was pretty cool and so I took a picture of that and I organized a little bit but then I did this so that's the ultimate getting high that's your straight up above something and that's very cool when you're trying to get a pattern you're trying to get a graphic simple image this is much more compelling to look at and interesting than the one I just showed you because I got high straight up, and you can find patterns all the time when you do that. Okay, get low. This is uh, one of the running groups I coach. We have a, uh, we're a 10K program, and our ultimate training run is about six and a half miles up we, uh, what we call Golf Ball Hill down in South Tulsa. And I put the fear of God into them week after week after week, we're going to get to Golf Ball Hill. And here it comes. Last Saturday, we did Golf Ball Hill. So here is a picture of one of the groups. And how do you know this is Golf Ball Hill? You don't really know. It's just a bump. It's nothing. But if you take a picture while you're laying down on the ground, mm -hmm. looking up at the tower that's called Golf Ball, because it has a golf ball at the top, then all of a sudden, you feel like, oh, I understand. They reached Golf Ball Hill. 